Hey guys, it's Will here and I'm back reviewing another new book from GW. Now, um, as you can see, this uh, is a little bit of a different setting to my normal ones. Normally film on down 40k gaming with Sam. Um, for various reasons we weren't able to, to do that. Um, just didn't quite work out tonight. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing this on my own. Um, probably won't be as long as my other ones either and perhaps not as in-depth. Not because I'm not committed to the, or excited about this project uh, product, but simply because it, it's very different to the stuff I've looked at before. So before I've been doing 40k rule books with new rules for new units and formations. And that's all really good stuff. And uh, yeah, that's all been good. But tonight we're looking at the Age of Sigmar General's Handbook. Now, unfortunately, I haven't got a copy of it on me. Um, basically, it's not out yet for another nearly two weeks. Um, but most GW stores and a lot of, uh, sort of local gaming shops have all, uh, all got copies of it and I've been able to have an, um, a decent read through it at 40k gaming. Not seen everything but you know, been able to have a, have a good look at particularly the bits that were of interest to me and uh, you know, just get a good overview of what's in there. So I'm going to be doing this review based off that. So, um, yeah, first thing is, um, let me see, what have I I've written down a whole load of notes here? Because, like I say, I haven't got the book on me. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to be able to go through everything in detail. I'll show you any of the pictures from it. But I can give you my, my initial impressions and an overview of what's there. So, to start with, it's only £15. And I, when I heard that it was going to be so cheap, um, by GW standards, um, thought, okay, well, it's probably not going to be a particularly thick book then, might have a couple of missions, the points, and a couple of other little bits, but actually it's a really solid book. Um, it's softback, which, as I've said before, I really like with GW books at the moment because um, the hardback, hardback is designed to endure, but the problem is the GW hardbacks, yeah, the book endures, but the rules go out of date within two years half the time anyway. So it's like, is there really much point in this being a hardback? Might as well be a softback. If it gets dog-eared in two years, oh well, there's a new one coming out. So I like they've done it in softback. And it is a, as thick as a codex in terms of the number of pages there. You've got a good amount of content in here. And... Also, it doesn't have a lot of the filler that I feel like a lot of codexes have. It has some fluff and artwork in it, but compare that to, say, the Space Marine Codex. You've got a lot more content, page by page, a lot more content in here than you have, um, you know, just uh, general pretty pictures and regurgitating the same fluff as that was in the last one. Um, not that, you know, having fluff in the books is a bad thing, but I feel like for this, you really do get bang for your buck on rules. Now, say 15 quid, if you get your buck down 40k gaming but while it's still up on pre-order, it's going to be £12 because they do the 20% um, the off on all pre-orders. So, uh, yeah, that's just over a tenner um, for this. That's a really good bargain for the amount of stuff you're getting in here. So I would say if you're remotely interested in Age of Sigmar, um, whether you play it at the moment or you're thinking, hmm, I've got my old Warhammer Fantasy Army, maybe I'll try porting it over to Age of Sigma. Seriously, think about getting this book. But anyway, what have we got in it? Excuse me. Um, so yeah, basically there are three ways to play. That's kind of how it's subdivided. Open play, narrative play and matched play. And each have basically got their own section with an introduction to what it's all about. Now, open play, the first part, to be honest, I didn't read too much of it um, because it's one that probably least interests me. Um, not that it's a bad way to play it, it's just not my style of play. Um, but from what I saw, you've got some new battle plans in there um, and some multiplayer missions, um, you know, rules for having more than two players aside. That sort of thing. Like I said, I didn't read too much in depth of it, but you know, if you if that's the sort of thing you're interested in, it's in there. If not, it's not. But it's probably the smallest of the three sections. So, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, there's plenty of other content for people who aren't too interested in open play, which is probably the most similar to kind of Age of Sigma as explained in the just the four page rules. And you've got narrative play, and this actually has loads of cool stuff in it. 
So to start with, you've got some new scenarios, um, new battle plans, they call them, um, that are like based off historic refights of events from the fluff. Now, you get a lot of these in all like a lot of the other books for Age of Sigmar as well. Like you get new battle plans of practically everything that comes out. But again, these are some some other ones you can use if you're looking for different ways to play it up. And what I saw in there looked like a really big battle with um, Archeon leading one side and Nagash leading the other. So uh, yeah, seriously big, uh, big battle there um, with two of the most badass characters in the game. So uh, that looks like it could be quite fun. But then the main focus of the narrative section is on campaigns. Now there's, there's four types of campaigns that it goes into detail about, not to say that there aren't other ways you can do an Age of Sigmar campaign, but these are the, the ones that, um, that they talk about in the book. Um, so the first three are um, a matrix campaign, a tree campaign, and a map campaign. Now all of these, you know, are a series of linked battles that essentially tell a story. Um, story of a of a war or a cam you know a military campaign. Um, of those, the tree and the map are things we've seen before in other GW products. Um, talking about campaigns, so in a tree one, uh, a tree campaign, you have an opening battle, and then depending on whether side A or side B wins, you play either that mission or that mission, and you branch off like that until you reach a conclusion. And it gives a, an example of one in there. And it gives you some specific missions for that um, and even like a, a bit of backstory to a to how this campaign is running. I think it's Lizardmen or, or Seraphon as they're now called against Skaven. Um, so you've got the story in there and you've got how to actually run the tree campaign and the missions for it. Uh, you could certainly splice in your own missions, come up with your own tree campaign as a now with I think four or five of the um, Realm Gate War books out, there's plenty of other missions out there for Age of Sigmar, not to mention all the extra missions you get in the battle tomes. So uh, you could certainly design your own uh, based on those missions and the armies that you, you and your friend have. And you've got Matrix Campaign. Again, a lot of the same things apply. They've got a, a worked example. I think it is based off the same campaign and the same missions from what I saw. But with this, rather than having sort of a tree where it branches off, you have um, like a grid and you make like um, like side A's choice and side B's choice. You like make choices and then whichever, you know, you, you look, you know, you maybe have four choices for side A, four choices for side B, and then you plot mark on the grid where you get to. I'm probably not explaining that very well, but it's a, it's a type of campaign I've not seen before. And I think that's quite cool. Um, didn't read, too, didn't get a chance to read too much into how it works because there's just so much in this book. I couldn't read it all in the time I had, but uh, looked at an interesting new take on things. And then finally got a map campaign, which, um, you know, does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a campaign where you have a map and that um, you sort of use that to move your armies around on there and determine how it's fight, how it, uh, how the campaign's fought. So those are all uh, all nice little things. Um, but then the final one is the path to glory. Now this I'm properly excited about. They've done something like this before for chaos. Um, I think both. For <coughs> Sorry about that. Just choked for a minute there. Um, yeah. So the path to glory. They've done something like this before for chaos, where you have two players and you roll for the for what's actually in your army so you're building a warband um, so you have your leader and then based off whatever your leader is you roll on various tables to tell you how many of which units you get and the idea is that you build your armies up gradually so after every mission you get new units and there are um, specific missions that you fight and rewards and you're looking to get um, I think they're called glory points so for winning or achieving other objectives, you achieve these glory points and then you can use them to either spend on benefits for your army or save them up. And it's the first to a certain number of glory points who wins. And I always thought that was quite a cool idea, but not playing chaos um, in either system, 40k or fantasy at the moment. Um, I uh, didn't really um, get any use out of it. 
but now they've got the same system or a variation on it um, and they've done it for a, a significant number of the factions basically it's anyone who's had you know a proper rules update so you also got all the chaos stuffs there so whichever of the chaos gods including slanesh who has not permanently been written out of the fluff as far as i can see um you get all the chaos gods you've got tables for but you've also got ones for stormcast iron jaw orcs fire slayers and sylvaneth in there so yes yeah, basically anyone who's had a battle tome has a um uh, rules in there for doing that and that looks like a really fun thing that to be honest I think I might well end up doing a campaign based on that with Sam because um, we're both looking to build new armies for Age of Sigma I'm working on the Stormcast Eternals and he's doing Chaos um, he's doing uh, Corn Bloodbound the other guys you get in the starter box we've split one starter box already and we might well be getting a second because it's a really good value box but yeah, looking to uh, build up those armies, and this might be a nice little campaign to run to give us some guidance as to what to buy next. Um, it's going to take a little while to get going because I'm going to need a, a good number of units to play it with, and that's going to take time to paint. But yeah, should be uh, should be good fun. So look out for that on the channel. Um, uh, last thing I would say about that is I I wonder if other armies as they get battle tomes out will. Um, will get their own variations of this, perhaps in their battle tomes, who knows? I mean, we've already seen with the uh, Sylvaneth one that's coming out this week that there's new features that were introduced in here that have already been ported over into the Seraphon book. So uh, yeah, this is uh, quite an exciting time. Now, this isn't necessarily going to give the world's most balanced campaign because um, you get benefits for winning and, um, you know, you might roll up units that perhaps aren't so good. I know when we did a like a test run last night, um, just rolling hypothetically to see what we'd get, uh, Sam ended up with two Chaos Spawn when he was really hoping to roll up a couple of decent characters. So uh, yeah, it can uh, be a bit random, but you know, campaign games are never meant to be perfectly balanced. They're meant to be about fun and about telling a story. Um, along with this Path of Glory, you've got two new missions for that, but it says you can use any missions you want with that. So uh, yeah, there's uh, some fun ways to enjoy it there. And probably quite a lot of variety and replayability, especially with uh, you know already four Chaos factions and four other factions that you can uh, start building an army with. Um, which I think there was Flesh Eater Courts as well in there, the Undead, I think they have a, a thing as well. Like I say, I made these notes about 24 hours after I've actually been able to read the book. So some of this is, this is all from memory. So if I've got something wrong, do tell me. But, you know, most of this is, I think I'm, I think I'm right on. But yeah, that's, that's about it for narrative, um, which wasn't the thing I was most excited about. But looks like it's got some really good potential there. Certainly the Path to Glory looks really fun. And probably be late August, September by the time we're actually doing it. But, uh, you know keep an eye out for that on the channel. Now, finally, matched play. I think this is what most people who are really psyched for this book are particularly looking forward to, because it has been one of the long-standing criticisms of Age of Sigma that there's no point system and doesn't necessarily produce balanced games. There's a lot of ways the game can be broken, potentially. And um, yeah, match play is designed to make it a much more competitive game, the type that you might be might be used to if you've played something like 8th Ed Fantasy or Warhammer 40,000. Um, it's not exactly the same, obviously, it's a different game, but it's, uh, it's bringing back some of the elements to that to introduce a level of balance. Now, the thing everyone's going on about is points, 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 points for Age of Sigma. Whoa, yeah. And no, I'm seriously excited about it. I didn't mean to sound sarky there. You know, it is a good thing, but there is so much more than points. But I'll talk about that first because that's, you know, the big thing. So in there, they have tables of points for every unit. And I mean everything. You've not only got all your current range stuff, all your new stuff, but you've also got the out of date, out of production models. So Bretonians, whole army doesn't exist anymore. Can't buy them on the GW web store, but they've got points. Tomb Kings, again, they're dead. 
in fact they're so dead they're dead twice but they're uh, they got points there and all the outer production units like um, high elf spearmen for example aren't in the order battle tome and they're not available anymore same for sea guard and archers you know a lot of high elf units have been uh, squished pending new alternatives coming through and uh, yeah they're all points up in there now the the tables are broken down by faction and factions within factions so you might have to flick through a few pages to find what you're looking for but yeah if it was if you could play it in eighth ed fantasy it is in this book plus everything they've brought out since now one thing i did think was quite nice as well is there's not only everything they've brought out since but there's a couple of new things in there um, things that haven't even been announced that are going to be released yet uh, the ones i particularly noted were for the savage orcs or the bone splitters as they're now called you've got new unit types and new heroes in there so it looks to me like they've future proofed it for an upcoming savage orc release which is really exciting because it's uh certainly the most solid early leak we've had from gw for a while and um, probably well since they mentioned this so you can almost certainly expect the next significant release for age of sigma is going to be something for savage orcs which is really cool because uh I have about 30 to 40 Savage Orcs upstairs um, in various states of painted, unpainted, assembled, unassembled, falling apart, glued back together. Um, so, you know, it might be a good opportunity to get them out as well and uh, get my Orcs on the table. Um, the, uh, there's apparently also a new Ogre unit, but I was never too familiar with the Ogre units, so I couldn't spot it easily from the list as like, hmm, that's new, but... Another leak I heard somewhere said uh, there's a, a new ogre unit of some sort. So it looks like they might be getting something as well, which seems cool. Ogres haven't had any love for a long time. Um, only found a couple of minor glitches with it. It all looked pretty solid, but um, and they're more niggles than glitches. And they weren't in anything particularly significant. The first is Stormcast Retributors. Um, now, with the way the points are structured in this, um, I have to explain this to make this make sense, but you you don't have a points per model, you have a points for a set number of models. So for a hero, obviously you're paying a certain number of points for a single hero. For example, High Elf Prince on Griffin is 260 points. For um, units, you pay a set number of points per um, a set number of models so for example 100 points for five models um, in that case if you wanted to go for 10 models you'd have to pay 200 points um, 15 models you'd be paying 300 points and, and scaling up to a, a set maximum they have set mins, minimum and maximum sizes which is all good um, and then you get stormcast retributors now this annoyed me a bit because most of the units are priced um, in the box set size that you get them in. So, for example, um, Stormcast Eternal Judicators, they come in a box of five, and the points are for five. Uh, Stormcast um, Tempesters, the Dragon Riders with the Crossbows, they come in a box of two. They're priced for two. I think it's like 240 points for two. They're really expensive. Um, but yeah, they're. Um, you know, it's priced by the box set size. Now, the starter box for Age of Sigma has three retributors in it. What's the minimum size for a retributor unit? Five. Now, the problem there is that they, they specifically state with understrength units, if you don't have enough models in your collection to field the next size up, say you have seven models and you... You, so you have seven models in your collection and you want to field all seven so you have to pay first point first say 100 points for five and then it's another 100 points for another five but you haven't got the models but you still have to buy the whole lot so seven models would cost the same as 10 models or with retributors where you have um 220 points for five models you can't split that down and be like well that makes it however much it would be 45 I think it would I don't quote my maths there it could be wrong 45 points for um 
for five guys, uh, sorry, 45 points per guy. You can't sort of buy three of them. You have to pay for five, even if you've only got three. It's just a bit annoying because the starter box has those three in. So if you want to use them, you're either going to have to buy one of the official box sets that has five in it, or eBay another couple, or buy a second starter box. It's just a, a bit of a niggle for getting them into your army. It makes the, uh, the starter box not amazing for competitive but uh, you know for match play but you know it's uh, it's not the end of the world only other two things i noticed were um you all the upgrades that are listed on the war scroll you get for free which seems fair enough you get your musician in with your points you get your standard bearer your champion and any guys with a special weapon that's all good then you come to the frost heart phoenix um, now frost heart phoenix has an option of being ridden by an anointed and that's listed on the war scroll. So technically you get that for free, rules as written. But that is a huge, huge bo uh, boost to a Frostheart Phoenix. Um, you know, it's, uh, it gives it a four plus um, save against wounds already suffered, um, including mortal wounds. So basically like an old ward save. It gives it Obviously a guy on the top with an extra four attacks and a command ability and it makes it just go from a big monster to a big monster with a powerful dude on top and a command ability and a ward save. Um, and that's technically a free upgrade. So why would you not, you know, do that? But then the anointed is a separate model as well. Um, you can have an anointed on foot. I think it's like 80 points. And I'm wondering if their intention is that you pay the points to put the anointed on top rather than, you know, it's just included in the upgrade. But it doesn't say. So I think that might need FAQing at some point. Um, and um, yeah, I think those were the only two glitches I particularly saw in that. Now, with the structure for your army, they have brought in a system for structuring it. It's nice and straightforward. Um, you have you select your size of game whether it's 1000 2000 or 2500 now you could pick values in between but those are the examples they give and then for each of those you're required to take a number of battle line units now battle line units are equivalent to troops in 40k or core in fantasy um, so these are the guys that you know make up the the centre of your army as it were. So for Stormcast you've got Liberators and Judicators, for High Elves you've got Spearmen and Reavers, um, they're the best two examples because they're the armies I've been been looking at but uh, you know for Orcs you get obviously Orc Boys, Goblins, Savage Orcs, you know they're your basic troops and you have to take two at a thousand points, three at two thousand points and four at two thousand five hundred. Um, no limit on minimum or maximum points spend for those units, it's simply on number. So you can run four minimum units and then spend the rest of your 2,500 points on whatever else you like within a few other limitations. Or you can max out those units and make them really you know, bulky units if that's what you want in your army. It gives you that flexibility, but you just have to take a few of these core units to uh, you know, make it an actual army. Uh, next category is leaders. Uh, you have to take at least one of these and then uh, obviously to represent your general and then you take a number of additional leaders, you know, or up to a number of additional leaders depending on the size of the game. Obviously bigger games, you're going to have more options on these guys. Um, and the final option, is, well the next one is behemoths, which is all your big stuff, your dragons, your griffins, your wyverns, your giants. Um, all that stuff um, and you have a limited number there's no minimum but there is a maximum and the same with artillery which is pretty obvious what artillery is and then a lot of units just don't have a category like swordmasters don't have a category now this means there's no minimum and there's no maximum as long as you hit your other requirements um, and this probably represents about half the units in the game they're your units that don't basically just don't fit into another category so uh, yeah, that gives you a little bit of structure. Um, so you have to pick a certain number of core or battle line units. You've got to have a leader and you've got certain maximums. So it you know helps you build an army that actually looks like an army rather than you know just taking um, 
say 2,000 points, I'm going to take five High Elf Prince on Dragons, because they're 400 points each, and that's my 2,000 point army. It's, uh, you know, you can do that in open play, you can do that in narrative play, but it's not really a, a balanced army that you'd play a, like a match, a structured game with. So, uh, yeah, you can't do that. It just gives you uh, guidance for building an army. The other thing with these sizes of games is they give a recommended time limit. Now, I don't know whether that's intended as a an actual strict limit, like you have to finish within two and a half hours, or if it's more of a, a guidelines for, you know, you're planning a game, how much time you're going to have to aside for it. It might be intended to be used as both. I just didn't have a chance to go into the detail on those rules. Now that's certainly not all that match play is. I mean, the points and the structure for your army is all really good, but there's a bit more in it than just that. So to start with, you've got six scenarios, and unlike a lot of the scenarios where there's a, an attacker and a defender, or you know um, that that type of thing where they are there's a deliberate mismatch or um, even an unbalancing in some cases, these are designed to be very um, evenly matched scenarios like you both have the same number of objectives to achieve and there's six of those i haven't had a chance to read all of them although i have played played in two of them um and they they all seem like you know they're good balanced scenarios that will make you actually work to win the game on scenario rather than just trying to massacre your opponent and if you're playing these as part of a campaign because there's certainly no reason you can't use the match play in a campaign then you can um you know there's rules for major or minor victory um for example the game me and sam played last night we had one objective in each in the center of each deployment zone and you had to get five models in within six inches to capture it and no enemy models um and if you could capture both at the same time um, so you'd need to hold yours and your opponents then you'd win a major victory if not, um, then it would just be whoever killed the most points of stuff in five turns, and that secures you a minor victory. Obviously, major victory, minor victory in a, a one-off game doesn't make any difference. In a tournament or campaign, that you know that will. So that, that gives it a bit of a, a bit more meaning to making sure you try to win by scenario, uh, rather than just like, yeah, I'm just going to blast you off the table. Um, to go along with that, they've got a few little adjustments to the rules just to um, make it uh, um, a bit more a bit more balanced, I guess. So the first thing is summoning. Now, summoning in Age of Sigma can potentially be really overpowered, um, particularly if you've got a really powerful summoner like Nagash, maybe backed up by a couple of minor summoners. You can really spam out. Um, summoning spells and just bring on unit after unit you can even summon more wizards to do more summoning and yeah it just you know yeah it makes for a cool uh, a cool little narrative of all this dead rising all these demons coming in but for a balanced game it's just not going to work so what you do instead is if you're planning to summon units and obviously you have casters in your army that can summon you have to set aside a set number of points and that can be as many as you'd like, I think. So say, for example, I'm playing um, playing Undead and I'm playing a 2,000 point game. I could pick a 1,600 point list with then four, uh, 400 points um, to spend on summoning. Now, you don't have to declare what you're going to spend that on at the start. But as you go through the, through the game, you can summon units in a normal manner, but only up to that points cost of 400 points or however much you've chosen you've chose to put aside um, so it essentially makes summoning not about suddenly having so many more units than your opponent but rather being able to place the right unit in the right place at the right time because you don't have to declare what that is when you write your army list you summon whatever you like in the game so say for example um just trying to think of a good example here I'm playing chaos and I need to hold an objective hold an objective on the far side of the board and I need to get some cheap troops over there 
but all my cheap troops are tied up in combat. I move a fast summoner, say a wizard on the disc of Zinch, just as an example, into that sort of part of the board, and then next turn I can summon a unit of, say, pink horrors um, straight onto that objective. Um, but then the same army on another day might be like, okay, my opponent's brought loads of casters here and I need to shut down their magic. Okay, I'm going to summon a Lord of Change. I don't know if you can fit a Lord of Change in 400 points, but, you know, it's giving you that flexibility. So that's where the strength in summoning is rather than how it previously was, where the strength in summoning was just about completely spamming it and outnumbering your opponent a billion to one. So I quite like that. I think that makes a, a nice balance, but still gives summoning some sort of potential. Uh, there's a couple of rules about uh, ones always failing and um, just little things like that. And then it does specifically talk about house rules and say, you know, for tournaments, campaigns, etc. You're totally fine to house rule it. Um, you know, tournaments will often use house rules such as... Uh, measuring from bases rather than measuring from models and you know it fully supports the use of that if you want to as long as you know you're all in agreement on it so that I think is nice they're acknowledging that the community like to occasionally house rule things because it suits them better so rather than they completely change the rules they just say yeah you can house rule it if you want um, and I think that measuring from bases probably will be something that we're doing because it can you know, you can really start modelling for advantage if you're not doing that, and that can uh, just be a bit of a nuisance. Um, I mean, look at the high off prints on a dragon model. You know, those wings sticking right out to the side suddenly give any ability it casts. Um, you know, particularly if you've got a wizard on there, high off prints on a dragon with an enormous with a wizard in the centre, you've suddenly got a huge range out to the side because of your wings. So I think base probably works better, um, but you know, it, they sort of leave it up to you. And like I said, I've had a couple of games with this. Um, first one was in the GW store. Uh, I used my High Elves against a, um, a mixed Nurgle army. So there were mortal Nurgle warriors and also demons in there. They had the Glockkin. And in this particular mission, um, you didn't have place objectives at the start of the game. But instead, the objectives were meteorites that fell down from the Realm of Heavens. And at the start of turn two, of each player's turn two, um, a meteorite would land in their deployment zone um, and it would randomly land in the centre of one of the um, sort of three quarters of the deployment zone. So uh, you didn't know until the second turn where your objective was, but you'd both have one objective each and it was just whoever, you know, could get a unit to it and contest it and you'd score increasing number of points. So turn two, you'd your objectives would be worth two points, turn three they'd be worth three points, etc. And uh, that worked really nicely actually, it was a, a nice close game. I um, I went first but then my opponent um, had a back-to-back a -back turn, they um, got priority over me on the second turn and I was a bit on the back foot. Um, but then towards the end his um, objective was a little isolated because he pushed his army forward to engage me and just left a small unit of plague bearers on there. And I had a, a prince on a griffin that was able to get over there and deal with him. And he was hoping to swing the glockkin over and deal with him because he was fairly central, or they were fairly central. But I was able to push my sea guard and swordmasters forward to engage the glockkin, distract him. I actually killed him with the swordmasters in the end. They have so many attacks. And uh, yeah, um, made for that. I say early, early on in the game, I thought he probably had me because he'd smashed up all my phoenix guard and he'd used a, a realm gate to teleport um, a big demon thing across the board but uh, yeah we managed to uh, managed to pull that back and, and get a win in the end um, and that was good fun um, other one we played last night me and Sam he used his seraphon army against my uh, mixed high elves with a few of the stormcast I've got painted and uh, that was a little more um, sort of a, a slightly more predictable it was the most basic scenario there you basically have one objective each in the middle of your deployment zone and you have to get five guys near it to claim it and no opponent none of your opponent's guys and it did sort of 
I think the, because we're both a bit inexperienced, still kind of in that Warhammer fantasy mindset, it did grind down to big blocks fighting each other in the centre. But then it was about using manoeuvrability around the flanks to capture the objective, which I think he did better. He had some uh, Saurus Knights on cold ones and they came round and really started making a mess of my artillery and got to that. But I felt in both games they were pretty balanced. And, you know, it was, um, you know, the, um, you know, it flowed well. The missions worked and the slight adjustments to the rules worked. So I uh, I thought that was quite good. Um, I enjoyed that and looking forward to playing some more Age of Sigma. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's the General's Handbook. Oh, no, no, there's something else I haven't talked about. I thought I had more notes on this. So the final thing, we didn't use this in our games because we were, in fact, it's not even the final thing. I've got more stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, there's even more. But wait, there's more. Alliance benefits or allegiance benefits. So um, these are like um, magic items and command traits, which are like warlord traits. Uh, stuff that you get for uh, like as extra little bonuses. Now, in order to get these, your army has to be has to follow the correct structure, and you have to all be from the same grand alliance initially. So um, you'd have to all be forces of order, or all or all be destruction or death or chaos. And for that, you get like one little extra rule that's just generic. Every one of that faction gets it. And then you get a list of magic items and you can give one of these to one of your heroes. Now, it says you can choose it or roll for it. Um, so it says you can choose it. So, you know, I think for a competitive play, that would probably be the more uh, done thing. But for a little bit more of a random thing, you could always just roll D6. There's so six of them and they're numbered one to six. But it does specify you can choose them. And then you have the same thing with these command traits, which are basically the same as warlord traits. You can either roll for them or choose them. Um, so this is a nice little uh, benefit to picking an army that's all of the same Grand Alliance and just gives you a little bit more variety and flexibility and, and choice as well. Um, yeah, at the moment they've got them for the four Grand Alliances, but you can go more specific. So, um, for example, if everything is not just order, but order Stormcast Eternals, then you'd get specific benefits for them now at the moment they've only got one list of these out which is for the Sylvaneth now this comes out in the Sylvaneth book rather than in the um, General's Handbook so you're going to want to you know pick up your um, your book for your faction going forward you know like I say Sylvaneth have got it at the moment I'm sure moving forward they'll put it in the other ones where they've got new items and command traits specific to that faction and a list of spells you can have as well so you can give your casters new spells in these books now this is that stuff that's in the sylvaneth not in the general's handbook um, but it, it builds upon what's already there um, there's also a little bit in there about doing a ladder campaign where um, you have say it says six but it could be any number really of players um, and they play matched play matches but uh, it develops into like a campaign ladder so you uh, move up for winning you move down if you lose um, and it's a nice sort of way for a gaming club to structure its battles and you know have a make make the battles mean something more than just the just the winner or loser of that battle you know it goes into a bigger thing um, I think my local GW store is doing that and I'm hoping to get down there at least once a month for a game of this because uh, I'm you know, I seem a bit tired in this video now. It's been a long day, but I am proper excited about this. You know, it was a really good game last night and uh, looking forward to playing some more Age of Sigmar soon. So, yeah, going forward, um, I'm building a Stormcast army. Uh, probably will do some painting tutorials on that. Um, also, uh, got some bat reps coming, hoping that next Friday night, like still before the book's out, but when it's, you know, readily available to look at in stores, I'm um, going to do a battle report, thinking 2,000 points, my High Elves against Sam's um, mixed Corn Demon Kin and Bloodbound. Um, or Corn, Corn Demons, not Corn Demon Kin, but they are basically his 40k Corn Demon Kin, just spliced into Age of Sigmar, which you can totally do. So, uh, yeah, look forward to that. Now, if you're not interested in Age of Sigmar, 
which surprises me because you've just watched me talk for over 40 minutes about it. Um, don't worry, I have got um, 40k stuff on the way. I've got 40k bat rep I need to upload and I've got a painting tutorial halfway through. It's taken me a while, but I'll get there. Um, you know, there's still going to be plenty for people who aren't interested in Age of Sigma, but if you are, stay tuned because I've got a lot planned. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching, guys, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.